Cool. Hey, everyone. Happy Sunday. Sorry to drag you out here in a rainy morning, but uh, <laughs> we're going to talk more GUI today, so thanks for coming. Um, my name is Jonathan Kelly. I'm the creator of Dioxys uh, and recently Dioxys Labs, which is the formal company backing Dioxys. Um, for the past year, I worked at a, a company called Cloudflare. So I don't know if you know CDN, DDoS, they run 30% of the internet. Uh, eventually, I realized that Dioxys was taking off, so I had to quit. Um, so we actually went through Y Combinator. I don't know if anyone knows. It's like a prestigious startup school, and uh, that's over. So now we're here. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to work on Dioxys full time. So this is just the beginning, so to speak. And uh, there's a lot more to go. So we have a, a ton of new features planned. This is a, a tech preview in a sense, but also we're pretty mature in terms of documentation and community. So this is also a, a call for help and action for the community to contribute. Our vision's very wide. The problems are very deep. So this is a great project to get involved with if you're interested in Rust, open source, GUIs, and the future of apps. Um, my goal for this talk is to showcase the unique design decisions that went into Dioxys, and then also talk about building an app. So we're going to have a live coding session as well. Uh, Dioxys is very easy to get into. So our documentation is great. We have a, a bunch of great tutorials, examples, guides, videos, and this talk will serve as another uh, entry into that library. So without further ado, so what are we trying to do with Dioxys? First and foremost, we're trying to fix cross-platform app development. It's a very messy ecosystem right now. I don't know if anyone's been paying attention recently, but a lot of the cross-platform toolkits that have come have died. <laughs> I think we're left with main, mainly two toolkits out there, so React Native and Flutter. Um, and if you're going to go build an app today, it's kind of a messy process. So today, your users expect your app everywhere. Um, your users demand a lot. There are a lot of different devices out there. I mean, we're here in the land of single board computers. We have smart fridges, smart TVs, smart toasters, watches, obviously phone, desktop, web, mobile. Uh, I think a great example of an app that everyone is, uh, like knows or is aware of is like a music player. It's like the simplest of things. Came out 20, 30, 40 years ago, people listening to music forever. You know, in the US, we have Spotify. We expect Spotify to run everywhere on every platform, desktop, web, mobile, pretty much anywhere with a screen and a speaker. Now, if you, the humble student indie app developer, wanted to compete with any of these big companies that make these music players, you have an uphill battle. Your app, whether it's innovating on something cool, AI, has to run everywhere. And that is an uphill battle when you're competing with these large organizations. How are you expected to maintain an app on all of these different platforms? Across Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, tvOS, HarmonyOS, like there's more platforms than there are people to support them. You would need to know hundreds of different programming languages, uh, hundreds of different technologies and like seven, eight different programming languages. In today's world, it's not tenable. So we're left with a bunch of options out there for cross-platform app development. Dioxys is not the only one to recognize how difficult of a problem this is. Uh, and a lot of names that you might know or you might not know. Um, a lot of people will go the native route. So what this means is if you're on Apple's platform, you'd be building with Swift. And honestly, Swift is really good. So Swift UI is a, a recent addition to Apple's ecosystem. UI Kit is another really good one. And any time Apple releases a new piece of hardware, say like the Vision Pro, the augmented reality, you can pretty much guarantee that UIKit will work on, you know, Swift and UIKit will work on the new devices. Now, you're locked into Apple's walled garden. There's a lot bigger world out there than just Apple and iOS devices. You can reuse code across all of Apple's ecosystem, but you're glued to Xcode, which I know many people I know use personally. You need the Apple hardware, which is one, expensive and not feasible everywhere in the world. And two, you can't serve the 3.3 billion global users running Android or the 1.4 billion users running mini apps in WeChat. So our vision of the future of what Dioxys is includes exotic platforms, exotic targets, things like WeChat mini apps. Um, so what are your options outside of building native? Well, if you stick with JavaScript and React, which uh, 
Electron, React Native, Next.js, these are all JavaScript options. You can go pretty far. And I know many colleagues shipping startups built on these technologies. So this is what people are using today. You want a desktop app, you build an Electron app. So you're basically shipping Chrome. Uh, you want a mobile app, you're using React Native, which is super popular in you know, Silicon Valley. And then you want a full stack web app, you want to render stuff on the server, you want to build a client side application, you want them to work together. You're typically going to go with Next.js. All these are open source, all these are popular, but they have some pretty big trade-offs. With Electron, you're shipping an entire web browser. The entire Google Chrome engine is there just to play some music. We've come a long way since you know, the early 2000s where you, know, you could play music on an MP3 player. Now you need an entire web browser just to like, play your favorite songs. With React Native, you get subpar performance on lower end devices. There's been a, a monumental amount of engineering effort gone into React Native to making it usable on a lot of devices. But I think generally across the world, not everyone is running super high-end flagship iPhone 15 Pros, right? Like, there's a lot of devices, self-driving cars, uh, smart tractors that have been running hardware for 10, 15 years, and it's not feasible for them to just go upgrade the processor. There's a lot of devices out in the world that's just not an option. And if you're going to do back-end stuff, Next.js is, is really good. Uh, Vercel is a great deployment platform. There's a ton of guides, tutorials. The web is a great platform for building apps, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. And the issue for us is there's no code reuse among any of these things. So if you're going to build a, a Next.js app, you do some back-end stuff, and you want to integrate it with your desktop app, there's not really a good way. Like, you just build two entirely separate apps. Very little of the code can be shared between those two platforms, because they're so specific to what you're doing. And same thing with React Native, right? Like Vercel and React Native and Electron, none of that works together. So there's, an, there's a push to combine these things, um, but nothing is there yet. Now, we'll circle back on some of these technologies, and I think the biggest one that, that people look at these days is Flutter. Uh, what I'll say now before we circle back is like, Flutter's not great for building websites. So if you're going to do anything like e-commerce or you know, internal tooling or, or something public-facing like Google, you're rendering in a canvas. You're not rendering native HTML DOM elements, which in our philosophy is the wrong direction. We want to make all of the web developers also app developers, and all of the app developers also web developers. So we're really breaking down these barriers between platforms and technologies. So with these pillars in mind, I built Dioxys. We're a year and a half into the project, which is great. I'm up here on a stage after like, having a side project for a year. Um, we're written in Rust. We're inspired by React, so the most popular UI library in the world. Uh, and for the rest of today, we're going to talk about many of the interesting architectural decisions, and we're going to go about building a Dioxys app, so it's just something small so everyone can get accustomed. Uh, first and foremost, Dioxys is completely open source, so there's no closed source components, uh, and it's written in Rust. So we're trying to take advantage of all of the features that the Rust programming language has to offer which is a different direction from JavaScript is React, like the, the main UI library there. And then for Dart, it's Flutter. So we're trying to be the Flutter or the React of the Rust world and beat all of those different libraries and frameworks to the punch. Uh, we're also very popular. So we have 14,000 stars on GitHub, which is a great accomplishment. Um, unlike some of the other projects, like in the Rust ecosystem, we're trying to focus on being mature. So we have great documentation. You can go to the Dioxys Labs website right now, and our documentation is interactive. It's translated in different languages. I believe we have like a Chinese translation of like the README and a lot of our guides. So, you know, we're we're trying to get everyone in the world involved in our ecosystem. Um, I've been doing this for a year and a half, like I said. I used to work at NASA for a little bit. Uh, worked at Cloudflare. Uh, we're part of the GitHub Accelerator program, and recently Y Combinator. Um, and our ecosystem is really big. So we have a full-time engineer beyond me. Uh, we have three lead maintainers of the project and a vibrant open source ecosystem, which could include you. So you know, that's why we're here at the talk. Um, so we wanted to play into Rust strengths. Uh, it's an interesting choice to, to go down this, this route. So JavaScript being probably the most popular programming language in the world next to Python. And then you have um, like Flutter in the, the Dart, the, that ecosystem. Um, something we wanted to focus on was playing into Rust's strengths. And Rust can cross-compile basically everywhere. 
So like I talked about self-driving cars, smart tractors out in the world. Uh, Rust uses the LLVM, so the Low Language Virtual Machine Compiler, meaning it can reuse some of the tool chains that things like Swift and C, C++ have. So we can run literally anywhere. ARM, x86, Steam32 if you work in the embedded world, WebAssembly, which Rust is probably the like, main competitor for like, web-based WebAssembly, not backend-based WebAssembly. There's really no target Rust can't reach right now. So our user interfaces, our GUIs, they should be the same. Our widgets and buttons and components should look and feel the same no matter the target. If I'm building for a self-driving car, I want that to look pretty much the same as my desktop app. I probably don't have a self-driving car next to me to go test my app on immediately, so it's a much better developer experience if I can trust that what I built once at least looks, works, and feels the same across all the different targets. It means it's a lot of work for us on the Dioxys side of things, but it's less work for you as a developer building the cool new apps that change the world. If I spend an hour on a button for my web app, I want to make sure that button looks the same everywhere. Number two, Rust gives us the power to manually manage memory and performance. Authors should be making their fast that nobody even cares about benchmarks. It's Rust, it scales, it's as fast as C, C++. We're not worrying about virtual machines and garbage collectors and performance on low-end devices, so this is a solved problem. And when we go about building things like Dioxys, we also need to think about performance and manually manage memory and all the, the nitty-gritty details. So you, the developer, building the next cool app, don't have to worry about that. And then, you know, building on those two points, Rust emphasizes the developer experience. So we're trying to do all the hard work so you can do the, the actually important work. So we, in the Rust ecosystem, we love Cargo, which is the package manager. There are over 125,000 packages in the Crates ecosystem. So maybe it's not as big as the 4 million in, in JavaScript, but it's, it's pretty sizable. Um, we have integrated testing, so you can just slap a test right into your code, click the button, and your code is now tested. Uh, and there's great error messages. So while, yes, Rust is hard, it's harder to learn, it's also a lot nicer to you when you make mistakes. It gives you very in-depth errors. Um, so you can get really far with just a little bit of knowledge. And we designed Dioxys to not require the entire Rust programming language to be productive. So we've taken a simplified subset of Rust. You don't need to know everything. And you can be super productive right off the bat. I would wager that building a Dioxys app is actually a great way to get started in Rust. So as authors of these UI libraries, we should be leaning into designing clean and simple libraries that make the appropriate trade-offs between performance and development speed. So Dioxys is taking a very pragmatic approach to the next generation of app development. We are trying to be a mature, production-ready framework. We're not trying to be another experimental preview in this world. We want to be you know, out there, large developer community, people shipping real apps that solve real problems. So we're trying to get out of that, that fog of what's the cool new hip technology on the block and actually build something useful that people want to put in production. And I, I think this speaks a lot to the state of the Rust GUI ecosystem. There are like 50 libraries to do Rust GUI. Um, and this is just one part of building apps. So my colleagues here are talking about you know, entire operating systems or, or abstractions over system things like notifications, GPS. A lot of that hasn't been built because people can't stop waffling about what is the next approach to GUI. So the Dioxys approach is take what works from the rest of the world what has been proven over the years, React, HTML, CSS, server-side rendering, cross-platform, take that, be pragmatic about it, and you know, build on top of Rust, which has all this amazing tooling. So we're trying to get out of this you know, experimental development page. So without further ado, we can finally get to Dioxys. This is what we think the future of app development looks like, declarative and component-based. I think GUI development over the past 20, 30 years has proven that it's much easier to manage apps when they're declarative, meaning you describe what you want the UI to look like instead of modifying buttons and styles on the fly. Sure, you get a lot more control when you're like sitting there changing the color of a button when the button's pressed, but it's much easier just to say, I want the, the button to be red or the button to be blue. Uh, it's React inspired. So React has taken over the entire web dev world I'd say the, the GDP generated by React developers globally is, 
it's through the roof. Like people build websites, all sorts of things all the time. And it's probably the most like knowledge technology out there. Most people know how to build React or they can learn React fairly quickly. Uh, and Diaxis uses a virtual DOM. So if you're keeping up with web development right now, there's a big debate on whether or not you should even be doing this. Uh, it's a particular technique we'll talk about in a second, which adds some overhead. But what we think that we can get out of the virtual DOM gives us all this functionality that a lot of UI frameworks don't have. And of course, we want to be cross-platform. We want to be on smart tractors and self-driving cars. So we have to be you know, agnostic to the platforms that we run on. Uh, first and foremost, we want to target web, desktop, mobile. I think that's where the vast majority of users are out there. Uh, but we also want to target places like terminal user interfaces, which is really cool. Uh, Live view, which is like this new paradigm to building for the web, which is a lot faster. And we're working on augmented reality, virtual extended reality via Bevy and other integrations. Uh, and we need to maintain exceptional performance in all these targets. Once you've shipped a self-driving car or a smart tractor or you know, a 737, that hardware is there for 20, 30 years. So we have to be thinking about, well, how fast can our apps run today versus what they're going to look like in the future? The platforms we're targeting are not being upgraded every year. They're up being upgraded occasionally. So we have to stay as fast as possible for the lowest end of devices. Um, and then we also prioritize developer experience. So right off the bat, we wanted to make sure we had hot reloading and really, really good dev tools. So if you mess up when building a Diaxis app, the errors are really good. And we do a lot of runtime catching of things like tasks taking too long or async being stalled. We're actually able to catch a lot of those things and tell you exactly where in your app these issues are happening. Now, the architecture of Diaxis is very interesting. We use a virtual DOM, which I don't know if anyone here has an idea of what this is, but essentially it means we keep an idea, idea of what the app should look like in memory. So you're not playing with native elements directly. There's a layer between you and the system, which gives us the ability to separate a Dioxys app from the target that it's running on. The React definition of this is, is super useful. The virtual DOM is a programming concept where an ideal or virtual representation of a UI is kept in memory and synced with the real DOM by a library such as Dioxys. The process of the syncing is called reconciliation. So this approach enables the declarative API of Dioxys, which we'll see in a second. You tell Dioxys what state you want the UI to be in, and it makes sure that the DOM matches that state. This abstracts the typically error-prone manual manipulation of DOM elements that you would otherwise have to do for very complicated apps. And the Dioxys architecture is, is bent around these, these three pillars. So we have a state management concepts, we have a widget layer, and we have the drawing layer. And all of these are modular, though you're, you're pretty much anchored. If you're going to choose Diaxis, you're pretty much anchored to state management. Uh, you can use different layers. You can pick and, and choose which part of the stack you want. Uh, I like to s describe it as like Lego blocks or the, like a Jenga tower. Like you can put any blocks you want into the, into the system and, and get something cool out. The default platforms we give you, you use Diaxis Core as the fundamental state management library. This gives you that React-like experience, gives you hot reloading, it gives you reconciliation for all these different targets. Uh, and you're taking advantage of a lot, a lot of the React concepts like hooks, so like use state, use signal, use ref, those sorts of things. Uh, context, which means you can pull state from anywhere in the tree down. And then signals, which are a, a cool new old pattern for managing state in very complicated apps. All this is built around the virtual DOM. At the widget layer, we have Diaxis HTML, which is our like main, you know, you can target divs, buttons, headers, labels, the typical components you would do on the web. But you can also pull in any set of elements that you want. So there's a community-driven renderer called Freya, so Freya UI, which uses Skia, which is the same rendering engine that powers Flutter. So you can actually drive the Flutter rendering engine from Dioxys, and there are projects that do this. So it's very cool. So you can take advantage of all the different parts of the ecosystems out there that you want and drive it all through the same interface. Uh, we're working on augmented reality, virtual reality next, which is super cool. Um, and then you, you can plop in any rendering layer you want. So I said you can use a Flutter layer. You can render using web views, which is like the typical Tari web-based approach. Uh, someone has written an, an eGUI integration layer, if anyone knows what eGUI is. So an immediate mode rendering engine. So you can drive eGUI from Dioxys. Uh, hasn't been built yet, but you can drive MakePad from Dioxys if you so choose. Uh, maybe the MakePad folks will make an integration layer. 
All right, we finally have a code sample. It's taken us a little while. Uh, oh, hopefully you can see that. The comments are not great. So this is like what the simplest hello world would look like in Dioxys. Um, the let count equals use state up there. So that is like the state management. That's how you store state in your, your UI apps, your, your GUI apps. Uh, this is agnostic to any render, target, platform, or anything. So this is reusable. So if you wanted to build a new type of hook that use state hooks, so new state management, say you're connecting to a WebSocket on a foreign server, or you're like pulling data from the hard drive, that is completely agnostic to the target that you're running on. That can run literally everywhere. Uh, then we have the widget layer. So this div, hello world. This is like specific to HTML and CSS. So you're, you're working with this like set of elements that the platform is giving you. You have to expect that the renderer knows how to render those elements. So in this app, we're rendering with Dioxys Web. And Dioxys Web knows how to handle divs and headers and scripts and all the stuff that HTML and CSS provides. And all these are swappable. So you can use Dioxys Desktop instead. You can use the Fray UI elements you want. Or you can pull in new state management solutions that are out there. Cool. All right. So we're going to do a little bit of live coding. You're going to bear with me while we have technical issues, as there always are. Everyone see that? We good? <laughs> All right. So this is where you typically start for a Rust project. I just created this with cargo new, and then I created the project. Uh, I, I pulled in some dependencies. So we're going to look at the dependencies real quick. Uh, everything's running locally, just in case that you know the Wi-Fi didn't work. The Wi-Fi works, but just in case. Uh, so you would, you'd add these Dioxys dependencies to your app. So Dioxys, Dioxys Desktop. We have the router, in case we want to get into that. Uh, signals as an alternative state management solution. Like I said, the state management layer is also swappable. So we're using a, a new modern one that's uh, it, sort of experimental right now. And then we're pulling in like the typical suspects in the Rust ecosystem. So Surti and Tokyo. And uh, we might as well add cargo add request while we're here to do fetches. Cool. All right. All right, so this is where we start. A blank slate. Every new app starts with fn main. Um, first, we're going to we're gonna have to import our prelude. So if you're used to Rust, uh, there's typically a set of common things you have to import for whatever library you're using. So we're going to use uh, Dioxys prelude. Cool. OK, nothing happens. Um, and then we do, we'll do Dioxys desktop. So this is a. Uh, the crate that provides the desktop renderer for Dioxys as an like, electron alternative. And then we need an app. So if we save this, we can't find the app. So great errors, of course. So we'll make an app. All apps in Dioxys are functions. Ooh. Ooh. Cool. Uh, they all take this scope object, and they return an element. So kind of like React, you have functions that return elements in the tree. React's state management is implicit. So you don't really see this scope object show up in any React components. But because we're in Rust, we have to make this state management explicit. So there's actually a lifetime, a Rust lifetime, that connects scopes to elements. Uh, if we just want to render something simple, we call render, say, hello world. This is the simplest app we can get. And then we'll cargo run this. So give it a second. Cool. So we see Hello World. It's, it's not the most exciting of demos. But if you think about it, we went from zero to Hello World in like five seconds. So that, that's pretty cool. It's hard to do that with like an iOS Xcode project. Uh, we'll close this. Dioxys sports hot reloading. Uh, last time I talked about this, we saved it for the, la for the end. But I actually think it's such a normal feature now that we can uh, run you know, the, our entire presentation with hot reloading enabled. Uh, we have hot reloading for all the different platforms. In this case, we're just going to use the desktop platform, if you guys can see it all the way down here. Uh, cool. And then we'll move our windows around. Cool. All right, so we have a hello world rolling. That's pretty simple. That's pretty fast. Uh, hot reloading is enabled, so we can type, and it updates live. Uh, not a lot of Rust projects have this. The two projects that you've seen today and yesterday, MakePad and Dioxys, are like the only projects in the Rust ecosystem that have hot reloading. So, you know, you're in good company here. <laughs> we're we're trying to productionize all this stuff. Uh, so this is HTML and CSS. So, what you're used to, you can just use. 
We don't use the same syntax as HTML and CSS. We use something closer to like Flutter or uh, Swift UI or, you know, we don't use like br braces. We use like curly braces. So in this case, we can have a header and then we say hi. Get rid of this. Uh, it's not like the typical HTML and CSS syntax. We think that's noisy and unnecessary. Cool. We get hello. Uh, hot reloading is cool. So we can do this a bunch. So that iteration cycle is super quick. Um, we can do styling as well. So styling is done through CSS. There's a whole world of CSS out there. I don't need to be a CSS expert. Even Copilot has a good idea of what's going on. Uh, so border, one PX solid black. This is the body. Cool, all right. Hot reloading, so cool. Uh, yeah, so we can iterate quickly. We can use the entire world of, of CSS that's out there. Uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, we can even drop in like styles. Uh, so yeah, we can set the body background red. I think this, oop. Uh, yeah, we'll get rid of this. Yeah, we can pull in like normal style sheets. Uh, I'm gonna use what they call Tailwind CSS so everything doesn't look as ugly today. Uh, we have that going here. So we can customize like the styles that we pull in. I have a different head that pulls in the like Tailwind Setup, cool. So things look a little bit different, but now we can use the, the Tailwind classes, which are super popular in web development. So you can see that like the, the high is really small, uh, but we can set like a class on it to so do, let's say, uh, text 3XL, font bold. Cool, all right, so we're able to reuse a lot of the same web dev technology that we have out there. Uh, what's really cool is we can take advantage of the entire web dev ecosystem. Uh, I, when I build apps, oops, I love, I use a tool called shuffle.dev. Uh, there are online like HTML and CSS template builders out there. Uh, shuffle allows you to like customize and, and pull in anything from like the React, or from the Tailwind side of things. So this is like a project I built before. Um, there's not much going on, but this like HTML is available to us so we can actually pull in Let's see, we have this div. We can copy it. We'll come into here. We paste. So this is HTML. It's not our meta language. Uh, we have a VS Code extension that actually converts these. So you can convert to uh, the, the Rust variant. And then we're able, so we've been able to pull in like a component off the shelf from the internet and just throw it in our app. So, that iteration cycle is quick, and we can take advantage of all the technology that's out there already. Um, let me get rid of this real quick. We'll rewind. Uh, get rid of some of that styling. Cool. All right, so we're back to basics. Uh, the meta language that we have is not turn complete. It's like <laughs> it's supposed to be as simple as possible, so you don't have to learn as much. Uh, so we can do things like for x in zero zero or zero dot ten. Um, RSX, cool. So we can do things like iterators and conditionals in line, and they're, they're pretty simple. It basically looks like Rust. It's almost Rust compatible. Uh, and then we can do things like getting lists out. So you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We can do conditionals as well. So if true, which is not going to be super helpful, uh, this is a true statement. This is true. This will always be true, of course, so we're, we should see it. If all, if all goes well, we should see this is true. OK, cool, all right. Now we have a good idea of the HTML, CSS, the markup that's happening. We probably want to add some state to our app. So the simplest way is adding some sort of interactivity. Uh, usually, we'll get rid of some of this. Usually, this might look like uh, we have a button. This is a button. This is the button. And then we'll add like an on click handler to it. Move. And then we'll like say print online. Hello world. Cool. So we had to refresh the entire app because we modified Rust code that couldn't be hot reloaded. Uh, just the elements themselves can be hot reloaded, but when you go and start messing with Rust state, we'll do our best to preserve whatever state you, whatever state you had between renders, like when the app had to be reloaded, but we can't save everything. Uh, now, we click the button, 
It says hello world, but nothing changes. It's not the most exciting app. But it's, you can see how we went from zero to adding an on-click handler pretty quick. Uh, we can add some state to the app. So the simplest like fundamental building block to Daxis is uh, use hook. allows you to store any mutable state between renders. Uh, so we're going to say let, let count equals say use hook. We pass in this closure, so this is what will run the first time the component is rendered on the screen. Uh, we'll say mute. This is, and then we'll say uh, counts is here. Counts is here. All of the strings in our meta language support formatting by default. So whenever you put something in curly braces, it gets formatted for you, which is super useful. Uh, we reload because we modified some stuff. Uh, we press the button. We should see logs, but yeah, nothing's happening. So obviously, we didn't add that functionality. In our onclick handler, we can actually modify the count value. So our star count plus equals one. Cool. All right, so we're pressing it, and still nothing's happening. It's because we, told, we haven't told Doxus yet that it needs to re-render. So there's this, this dance that you have to do where you modify state, and then you tell Dioxus that this component is dirty, that it needs to be re-rendered. So in this case, uh, we've modified the state, and we can even print it if we wanted to. But we haven't told Dioxus that, hey, you need to go update and reconcile the, the real version of the tree with the virtual version, that virtual DOM we've been talking about. Doxus provides this via CX that needs update. So if you were going to be super manual, which we're like working from fundamental building blocks here, you would do this little dance. And then finally, we see the count update. So it took us a while to get here. But we can build on top of these things using better abstractions. Uh, the one that you run into right off the bat is called use state. So this is very similar to the, the React use state. Uh, instead of CX use hook, we'll do use state, CX zero. We don't need needs update anymore. And we can just say count plus equals one. Cool. Cool. So it, it handled all of that for us. There's not much complexity between like use state and that like needs update dance. Um, but there's an even better version of the state management that we like to call signals. They're super popular outside of Rust, super outside, like popular outside of Dial Access as well, uh, which have a similar API. So use signal. It's typically what people use these days as we like, migrate away from some of the React paradigms. Um, you can migrate without even changing your code, so your signal still works. Uh, cool. Now, we want to abstract some of these things out into components. We said that Dioxys was declarative and component-based, uh, so we're going to build our first component. Uh, we'll call it child. Same scope. And then we're going to just rip this button into it. So render. All right. All right, we have a button. We're moving the count over. Cool. So our top level app, we can. Uh, call these children components. So this should kind of look like what we had before. <laughs> All right, so we still have a button. The count is updating in the button. It's not the most beautiful demo, but you, you understand what's happening. Uh, the fact that these are components is, lets us just make a bunch of them. And the state is now encapsulated within the components that we made. So all these buttons are different. Right? Cool, OK, so you get an idea of, of how we can like take state, build an app, and then like separate that app out into components. And then we can scale apps to really, really big sizes, you know, very large teams because of these like boundaries of separation. Uh, components can take properties. So in this case, uh, let's say we wanted to pass more state down. So we'll say uh, we'll create props for this child. Extract child props. Uh, these properties need to be like memoizable is what they call it, meaning you need, to be com you need to be able to compare the old version of the props and the new version of the props. So every time a component renders, we have to create some properties for that component to take. They're basically like function arguments when you go to create the component. Uh, in this case, we'll have like maybe an offset. So this offset we can pass into the child component. Uh, we need to attach two derives. So we need partial equal and props. 
And then we make the scope generic over child props. And then we should get Rust complaining. Cargo check. Yeah, so Rust will complain that we actually didn't include this offset when we went to render all of these components. So let's, let's fix that real quick. I think Rust analyzer died. Oh, this is not illuminating. Here we'll add, we, gotta, we need to add some of the functionality. So we'll set this offset to 10. Uh, props are now accessible in the child via cx.props. So we can do, uh, we can add one plus cx.props.offset and then we'll do this. So now every time we click the button, ooh, perfect. Yeah, now every time we click the button, we should see the value increment with the offset. So in this case, it, it went up by 11, 22. So, so you can see that we've been able to pass state in from the parent to the child. Uh, we can do this with a bunch of different values. So we'll set this one to one, two, three, four, five. And now you, now you can see when we increment this one, it should go up by two. This one should be three, four, five, six. So cool, we've been able to abstract state, pass properties down into child components, uh, and then we can get all the state to coordinate. So you could see how we would attach maybe like a, a, a signal up above the, the children and then pass that down. So this is a good like general introduction into like what like basic state management looks like. Uh, another thing people might use, which is popular in React, are contexts. So we can create like a state that doesn't actually need to be passed via props. This lets you do things like themes, which are implicit and they might be everywhere all over the app. So you wanna set like a dark mode or a light mode. Instead of having to pass dark or light into every component, components can optionally reach up into the tree and try to pull that state down. So we can do context. Um, in this case, we'll say bool, we'll say false. So this is like dark mode. Um, use context provider. Actually, we have a, a method for this. So by default, we're, when we go look for this type of Boolean in the tree, when we look up through the context API, it should be false. So let's, that is dark mode, let's use context provider. Use consume context. It's context. And in this case, we have to set the generic to bool. So now dark mode is now projected through the app. Uh, we can unwrap it with the question mark, so you get typical Rust air handling. Uh, and then we can say, you know, if, if is dark mode, render dark mode, okay. So by default, assuming all this works, it worked. Uh, we shouldn't see dark mode on any of these things because we have no like way to toggle dark mode. Um, and then if we set this to true, we should see the dark mode. And we can wire this up to things like selectors. Yeah, so now we have dark mode. So we've been able to pass uh, state through the tree using this context provider into child components. And there's now no connection. So we could actually remove the offset. Uh, yeah, we'll remove this. Uh, yeah. Cool, so now there's like no properties connecting the child and the parent components, but we still have state projecting through the tree. So this lets you build very complicated stuff. It's, it's bigger than we can like cover here, but things like themes or being able to share like handles to hardware, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, something that separates Dioxys from a lot of the other platforms out there is like one, ability to do async, and two, ability to talk to the file system, do things like native I.O. So when you go to build a Tauri app or a Flutter app, you have to work through system layer shims. So in Tauri, you're building an RPC type system, so you have to basically build a back end and a front end, whereas in Dioxys, we can do things like just talk straight up to the file system within our components. So we're gonna do a little bit of async, which is typically challenging for you know, frameworks, uh, we're gonna do a little bit like delays, waits, and like fetch if we can from the network. Um, so we're gonna come up to here. Let's do all this back. Div, counter, 
OK, so we're going we're gonna to build a little timer. Oops. All right, so we have our, our, our count going here. We can uh, set it here. Cool. And then we'll add a button. So reset. And then when we click the button, and click, move, count.set0. And then we can add some async. So we have uh, hooks, that's what we call them. There's like functions that extend the state management. Uh, we have one that allows you to do futures. So if you wanted to do like a, a counter that counts up indefinitely in the background, uh, we can say use future CX async. Cool. So when the component runs, this async task will fire off. Uh, we could just oops, async move. Yeah, so we're doing some Tokyo right now. So this is Tokyo Sleep. Tokyo is the Rust async library for doing native I.O. Uh, what this would do when the component runs is, is fire off this like, delay once, and then we'd see it render. And we can do that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not super insightful. But you see, OK, the timer ticked up. Um, if we toss this in a loop, then we have a timer. So OK, cool, we built a clock. Uh, and then we can reset it, and then it'll keep counting up. Uh, we could change the duration. So we'll do from millis, and we'll do like 100, or we'll do 10. So it's a little bit more insightful. So yeah, you can see the, the timer's like flying. Uh, we can easily add things like start, stop the timer. So we'll do running, new signal, pulse. Cool. If running dot get. Cool. And then we can add a new button that stops the timer. So one click, move. Count dot or running set running again. Dot. Cool. So we'll oop. do it. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, we need to move this here. All right. Ah, much better. There you go. Perfect, perfect. All right, we caught a little thing. So yeah, we can toggle our timer, and we can reset it. So this is a very quick way to like put together state management of an app. Uh, usually people say Rust is hard, and managing state in Rust is difficult. Uh, I think we've solved a lot of it, to be honest with you. So projecting state, being able to work with async, a lot of the stuff that makes UI hairy is, is pretty much solved, at least in Dioxys and Rust. Um, so I think that's, that's good for the demos. We have a bunch of other different platforms so we can take a look at. Uh, for example, we have, where's my, where's my slides? Uh, cargo app will open. Um, yeah, so this is an example of a, a mobile app running. Here, we'll replace it. Hopefully this works. Live demos with Xcode are always fun. OK, built succeeded. Cool, all right. So this is, again, just like a simple mobile app that we built using Docsys. So you can see, so we have, uh, we have desktop. We showed off mobile. Android Studio works, but we won't go look at that. Uh, we can even do the web. So we're trying to be the one cross-platform toolkit to rule them all. We might as well have our, our code work across all the platforms. So I'm going to steal some uh, launch code. Here you go. Within one file, we can launch for both web, desktop, mobile. Uh, so in this case, we have Docsys Web running, assuming I have it as a dependency. Oop, Docsys Web. So we have to add it. Docsys Web. Optional equals true. Cool. Here, we'll. All right, take serve. We 
we have to build. Oh, and then we can use Tokyo as well. Oh, and our code also requires uh, HTML, or the Tokyo. So to the Tokyo IO system needs uh, like web compatibility. Uh, we'll, won't worry about this for now. Here. All right, yeah, well, trust me, it works on web. Yeah, live demos in, in Tokyo. Uh, okay, so we'll go back to the slides. All right, so, there's a, a couple cool public projects out there using Dioxys in production. Uh, the European Space Agency and Airbus have collaborated on something called SkyTrace. Uh, so they're doing collision avoidance for satellites and like aerospace, aerospace objects. Uh, I'm, it, we're running in a cockpit of a 737 somewhere out in the world. Um, there's a, a really cool project called Ibu, which is a, a open source Mastodon client. Uh, Mastodon is a new social media Protocol, federated, decentralized. Uh, someone went out and built a, a very beautiful looking native type Doxus app. Um, and then uh, one of the other bigger companies using Doxus is a peer-to-peer -peer chat application. So they have a desktop, a web, and a mobile client all written in, in Rust and Doxus. Uh, I think a, a big question here is like, why would you not use X or why would you not use Y? Which we talked about a little bit, but I think it's, it's worth going into depth. Uh, Tauri is probably the biggest equivalent in the Rust ecosystem right now. And we actually use a lot of Tauri's libraries. So Tau, Rai are like ways of, of making windows and, and rendering into web views. Uh, the biggest reason you wouldn't want to use Tauri and like why Doxus is, is so cool is that one, Tauri doesn't give you direct access to hardware. So you can't do things like running on smart car or self-driving cars and, and tractors and all that because you're expected to have like a web browser, a very capable web browser on all these different platforms. Doxus can run natively. So we can render with Skia, we can render with WGPU, you can render with the Flutter engine, uh, which means we're super portable. And it also means we can talk directly to the hardware. So things like reading files or, or connecting to the network, we don't have to write binding layers and shim layers. Those system calls are native. Uh, we have no bridge layer. So we don't have to go and write a Swift file, a, a Java file, or any of these binding layers, we can talk directly to the system APIs that are provided to us. So when you go and you look at how do I send a notification with Dioxys, there's a notification library in Rust that wraps you know, Apple's notification library, Android's notification library, but you're not limited to just how there's a single abstraction for all those platforms. You can actually dip directly into the native system calls that will let you to do those equivalents. Uh, and we're independent of the JavaScript runtime. So you don't need JavaScript for any of this to work. We have JavaScript compatibility because the world runs on it. Uh, but you don't need any of that. And we can run on, on low-end devices. So you know, the, the Tauri versus Doxus option, Doxus is more portable. You can put it everywhere. Um, and similar with React Native. So we're 100% Rust. We don't need to jump into other languages to get the job done. You do have to talk to like system libraries, of course. Uh, but the overhead of maintaining an entire ecosystem of, of crates to do useful things like storage and GPS and location data is like maybe a magnitude less than it would be to maintain it in the React Native ecosystem. React Native has been working on this for the better part of a decade and is still not there. And there are startups built around this and they still haven't solved it yet because it's just a lot of work. Uh, Dioxys is also super performant. So we're the fastest like, production-ready Rust framework on the JS framework benchmark. So if you're going to go build a web app today, we're like basically 4 or 5% overhead to like, just running, like modifying the DOM. Even some of like, the libraries that brand themselves as super fast in, in the Rust ecosystem, you know, we like still 20, 30% faster. Uh, and it's specific on low-end devices as well. So we can run in places like STM32s or low-end ARM devices, single board computers that other places can't run. Uh, yeah. So I think the million dollar question out here is like, why not Flutter? <laughs> uh, one, the Rust ecosystem is huge. So it's a lot bigger than just building apps. So Flutter kind of has hitched its cart to Dart. And Dart is locked into you know, this Google e ecosystem. It hasn't really found adoption outside of building apps. 
which one means like pub.dev has a lot of really good libraries for doing app stuff, of course, but it also means you're not going to find a lot of developers who also do backend code or do you know, embedded or any of the, like, the harder domains. So there's 125,000 Rust crates. They're, all of, they're typically of really good quality. You have a lot of smart people working on the ecosystem. So it's really massive. And you can hire Rust engineers much easier out of different domains to go build an app. Uh, and again, we, we run natively, so there's no, no need to create binding layers. Building out this ecosystem of crates that make it possible to build complicated apps, it takes a lot of work. And when you have to jump through multiple layers, you have to jump through the, the virtual machine that Flutter gives you, and then you have to go talk to the hardware and those are all different languages. You need people that are skilled in, in so many different domains that it's, it's super complicated. Uh, I think the biggest reason why you would do Diaxis instead of Flutter is that we render HTML and CSS, which means you can go build a full stack web app. You can go build a backend that serves HTML with Dioxys. You can pick up that HTML and CSS on the client with Dioxys, and you can render it natively in like augmented reality, virtual reality with Dioxys. Whereas with Flutter, you're locked into Flutter's like widget architecture, the way they do styling and the way they do state management, which is not really standard across you know, any platform or any target. Uh, and in particular on the web, if you want search engine optimization, which is super important if you're going to be like a mature production ready business, Flutter doesn't give you that. Flutter gives you a canvas that it renders its own rendering engine into. And the apps that you're building are megabytes in size when you're building with Flutter. So you know, you're on a low end device or you're on a, a subpar connection, like you're out in the wild. Flutter is not a great option because the app is like five megabytes when it ships. Like the entire Dart runtime has to come down. Whereas when you're building with Rust and Diaxis, 65 kilobytes, like a typical React app, is no different than like downloading anything else. Uh, and then we can fully reuse code across the entire web ecosystem. So we're working on a deploy platform right now for Diaxis, which lets us share things like, you know, how do I do remote file syncs or how do I do web sockets? All this, all this code is, is unified across all the different platforms. Um, depending on time, how much time do we have? We have 10 minutes. Um, we'll, We'll leave some time for questions, but there's some cool innovations that have come out of all this work on Daxis. Uh, one, we like, pioneered this thing called templates architecture, at least in the Rust ecosystem. Uh, has enabled things like hot reloading. Uh, we're the fastest. So if you look, you, Sycamore, Leptos are the, the most popular you know, web frameworks in Rust beyond Daxis, and we're, we're the fastest right beyond like, WAS and Bygen. So there's not many points separating us between like, native performance and you know, Dioxys. So we're, we're very fast. And this templates architecture allows us to do things like batch mutations. So when we go to reconcile the DOM between the old and the new, and if you're doing this over uh, like a network, you have to cross this complicated boundary layer. In essence, we're able to bake a lot of the complicated decision making that the UI framework has to do at compile time. So there's like a magnitude, two orders of magnitude less work required to think about, oh, how do we go update the screen? When we have the power of the Rust compiler at our fingertips, we can do these super complicated optimizations with just the compiler. We don't have to think about all this stuff at runtime. And that puts us at, at the leader pack. Uh, Sledgehammer is a project we built that is actually faster than like, the native way of, of patching the DOM. Uh, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very fast. Uh, we also. We've talked about like we need manual performance management. Uh, there's a custom memory allocator, well, bump allocator, but uh, there's like a very fast bump allocator powering all this. So especially on low-end devices, memory management is like of utmost importance. And when you're working in things like Flutter and JavaScript, you have the garbage collector that goes in and cleans up a lot of the references you've made. Uh, we don't have that with Rust. The most we have are like RCs, like reference counting and you have to expect the drop handler to work. Uh, we get around that by doing our own memory management. Uh, what this means is when the component renders and then it re-renders, we don't allocate any new memory. We actually are able to like, work on top of the same memory that we've been going with so far. So it's very predictable in terms of like, memory usage, which is very important when you're running on like 500 to 512 kilobytes of flash. Like, you don't have room to run a garbage collector and to spin up huge sizes. You want to run on a smart fridge, you're not dragging a garbage collector with you. Um, so we're actually able to get a lot of the benefits of like double buffering, things that are high-end tech in like GPU world, uh, actually built into the framework itself. Uh, 
yeah, and I've talked about like the templates architecture. This lets us optimize away a lot of the like static elements. So if you look, the only dynamic component or dynamic elements of like this div, header, paragraph is this val, right? Val is the only thing in, in curly braces. So at compile time, we're actually able to, to create a pointer into this template. So we're able to optimize everything else that's static and create a pointer into the template that is like the dynamic content. So when we go to diff or reconcile the DOM, these optimizations are, are baked in at compile time. Um, we also have auto formatting. I didn't show it off, but uh, in Rust, typically when you build this like domain specific languages, they don't participate in the Rust auto format uh, system. We built a whole bunch of new tech that actually supports that. So it's baked into the VS Code extension. Anytime you save a file, your HTML, your uh, markup gets auto formatted. Uh, and this is really cool. So, so we've been able to upstream some of this into like Rust Analyzer. Uh, and then, yeah, we talked about hot reloading. So 